from the horn. My eyes snapped down, trying to comprehend what I'd seen without losing my sanity. My hands, my arms, my shirt was completely sprayed with blood, and more red droplets rained down on me. I opened my mouth and screamed. The world spun, went silent. I barely noticed my door ripping open and two sets of angry hands pulling me out of the truck before I blacked out. When the world stopped spinning, it blurred. I woke up with a terrible headache, woozy like I'd taken a long road trip on an upset stomach. The blood all over me, now dried to a rusty brown color, caused me to heave. My hands were tied to the back of the chair I found myself in. There was nowhere to go but to the side. I tipped my head and vomited, then barfed some more when I thought about how incredibly fucked we all were if these assholes could kill Seer in cold blood. Cold, rapid-fire words in Chinese echoed a few feet away. I struggled to make them out. Girls awake, go say hi. Maybe she'll talk more than these dead fucking grizzlies, if she knows anything. Three cold-faced Chinese men leaned over me. The one in the middle looked older, wearing a salt-and-pepper goatee. He reached into his gray suit pocket and pulled out a small LED flashlight. Oh, the asshole shined it right in my eyes. I jerked, feeling the light stabbing into my brain. Very responsive, just like your father, a voice said, switching to English. Miss Mathers, please call me Z. You sweet thing are going to tell us everything we need to know about this ambush. Ambush? What the hell was he talking about? I don't know what you're getting at. I came here to help my father with a business deal. You were supposed to be doing a contract together. Weapons, I think? He never really told me the specifics. I paused, considering my words. He never really told me anything. Club business? I managed a shaky smile, repeating the phrase that had always worked before as a substitute for fuck off. I had to play dumb. If I could convince him I was just a stupid little girl helping with the family business, I might walk out of this alive, or at least delay them until Tacoma could get some backup. But the entire club was here, wasn't it? I'd seen the bikes outside. Jesus, how many of them were still alive? You know I might believe you. Z smiled, slowly pacing around me, circling like a menacing gray shark. Why would dear old Dad tell you anything about what's really going on when he was willing to put you between two dragons? Z whirled, faced one of his men, and started talking Chinese. What a piece of shit. Bring him in here. We'll just see how much she knows. If she's telling the truth, we'll finish off his men, just like we planned. Sell her into slavery, perhaps. If she's lying, we do them all. I'll garrot this bitch myself. A cold, crazy chill ran up my spine. I saw him pull on something half-hidden in his pocket, a sharp cord, which he pulled up to his chest in the corner of my eye. Z fiddled with it a few times, undoubtedly thinking about slicing into my throat with it, and then stuffed it back into place. We wait, he said, staring at me with his dark brown eyes. Dear old Dad really must think he's hot shit. I flew here all the way from Shanghai, you know. My own fucking time and money, only to find out he meant to have me in that chair, ransoming me off after he killed my men. Z's hand slammed the wooden backside over my shoulder, rattling the chair so hard I could feel it in my bones. Fucking idiot. Biker trash. I'll rip his balls off myself, and he can watch them laying on the ground. You too, Miss Mathers, if you're telling the truth. He's wasted your time just as much as ours. His eyes bulged. He leaned in, looking like a total maniac. Great. So I had Jekyll and Hyde to contend with. That terrified me, even if it gave me a few narrow options for survival. No emotion. I couldn't let it come. I didn't flinch, didn't protest, didn't show any reaction to the psychopath whispering in my ear. When he stepped away, his face looked relaxed again, back to his somber, business-like expression. Z rolled up his sleeve and tapped his watch. 
an expensive platinum-plated luxury fit for a mafia don. A minute later, I heard several pairs of feet scraping on the concrete. When I looked up, two of Z's men were dragging my father into the vast room. His hands were tied together tight, and he looked like he was barely conscious. His movements were jerky, erratic, the protests on his lips so incredibly soft for being pulled along like an animal to slaughter. No, 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 he whispered over and over, as if he couldn't believe it. Neither could I. Hell, I could hardly handle what was happening in front of me. In all the years I'd grown up with Daddy disappearing, going away and coming back cut, bruised, or bloody, he'd never looked as terrible as this. So defeated. Dead like they'd already done him in. They'd bludgeoned him in the head. Blood dried in his hair and spread across his face, a rust-red spider web coming out of the huge scar on his head. Oh, God! Imagining the pain, my heart sank like a stone. It took everything inside me to hold back tears. The Chinese released him, and he toppled to the ground, laying like he'd just died. Z walked over slowly, calmly, and then slammed his polished shoe into my father's ribs. His bones cracked so hard I winced. You have a visitor, old man. Do you still recognize your own daughter? Or did that blow to the head fuck something up? Z grabbed my father's hair and pulled, yanked his head up like a doll's, until we looked at each other. Daddy's eyes went big and dark as soon as he saw me. I could have counted. Five, four, three, two, one, before he flew into a biting, kicking rage. Let her fucking go. I made a mistake. I fucked up bad asshole, but she doesn't need to be here like me and my guys. Just let her. Z nodded. Half a second later, his boys shoved my father back on the ground. One held him down while the other bastard punched him in the stomach until he stopped making any sounds at all. I pinched my eyes shut. Z grabbed my face, pressing his hands tight to both sides, and twisted my head around hard, forcing my eyes where he wanted them. Look, you stupid little bitch. I want you to understand. He's going to die. It's just a question of whether or not you go with him. Now, tell me truthfully, girl, were you involved in this ambush? No. I could barely hear my own voice. It came out sharp, cold, and distant, like I'd tried to shout down a long, vacant tunnel to someone on the other side. Hmm. I almost believe you, Ellie Mathers. Let's see if your daddy's got a little life left in him. Z spun and began walking over to my father, corralled by the two dead-eyed killers at his side. I hung my head, refusing to watch, even though it risked the Mafia Don doing something much worse. God damn it, Daddy, you screwed up bad, I thought, hiding my tears. I can't watch you die like this. I can't. Z had other ideas. He pulled my father's face up and lifted something from his pocket. I flinched, thinking it was going to be the garrot. Oh, God, I was going to watch the mobster slash his throat in front of me. No, wait, it was just a handgun. Sighing relief at the sight was so sick and twisted I wanted to laugh. Then the dragon don slammed it hard across Daddy's jaw. His blue eyes opened, going gray with anger. What the fuck? Daddy screamed through the blood filling his mouth. Shut up, Gil. Another vicious blow landed on his jaw, this time the opposite side. So nice of you to join the living again. For just a little while longer, anyway. I'm giving you one chance to save your daughter. Only one. And just to show you I'm serious. Z turned to his men and shouted in Chinese, Bring the others in, the ones we haven't killed. Daddy groaned in Z's grip, his head turning, like he wanted so badly to shake off the dizzy, hellish pain clouding his mind. For a second, our eyes met. I had to look away. One more moment and I'd have lost it, seeing nothing but I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, mirrored in his eyes over and over again. 
Apologies wouldn't help us now. We needed a miracle. Ah, oh, there they are. Z smiled and let my father fall to the dusty concrete floor, clapping his hands together. He switched to Chinese, barking his orders with bloodlust. Line them up. That's right, one by one, and keep your eyes on these fucking bastards. They'll try anything when they figure out how fucked they are. Six guys were still alive. It was a small relief, but my heart thudded hopefully, amazed to see anyone in the club alive. Uncle Line looked up, his single good eye going wide when he saw me. His mouth opened in a silent, round curse. Oh, shit. Z's two underlings were joined by two more, all of them cold, quiet men in business suits. They went down the line one by one, checking the handcuffs on each man, then stepping behind them on opposite ends of the row when they were finished. Their bastard leader turned his attention back to my poor father, grabbing his hair. Nice clear view, yes? How strange it must be to see your men lined up, defeated, completely at my mercy, Gil. Fuck you, Daddy growled. Don't know how yet, but I'm gonna fucking kill you, motherfucker. I'll rip your balls off with my bare fucking hands. Z laughed. Not just a throaty chuckle, but a full, high-pitched, scary-as-shit hyena cackle. I wished I could have covered my ears, if only to pretend we weren't all at the mercy of this ruthless psychopath. Oh, so feisty. I wonder what it will take to break a man like you, Gil. Yes, I could take the easy route and execute your daughter in front of you. Z looked at me, and I froze, my blood running glacial. No, too easy. She only dies if she's guilty. We don't kill the innocent here. Fortunately, I have my pick of you and your troops, all of them guilty as sin. You'll die, Gil, but not too quickly, I hope. Fuck. Daddy tried to twist in the mafia devil's grip, but he was too dazed, too screwed up to fight the death grip the man had on his throat. I'm going to break you first. We'll start with that one-eyed jackal at the end and see how far we get today. Sound good. Line. Oh, God, no, 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 no. Not Uncle Line. The vice president shared a look with Daddy, and he nodded, accepting whatever fate these animals had planned. Daddy's eyes bulged in horror, and he shook his head, refusing to accept it. I just cowered, trying not to remember all the times my Uncle Line bounced me on his knee, or let me stay up late when Daddy was gone, watching crappy reruns and eating pizza. The Mafia men all seemed to have garrot wires like Z. I watched one of them step up, put his arm around Line's throat, then pull a sharp string around it. His life would be over in less than a minute, dying in a bloody, gushing heap. I imagined it before it even happened, and that sent me over the edge. No more strong, brave MC princess. Just a scared one. A frightened young woman who'd never been cut out for any of this shit. I cracked. I cried. I fucking bawled until my sobs echoed off the high rafters, wishing I could be anywhere but here. Hell, wishing I could be back at my husband's embrace, the one who'd just disowned me because I'd been stupid enough to come here. Fuck everything. Fuck my life. I saw the Mafia grunt's arm twitch, ready to do the deed on Z's command. But he held up his hand instead and barked orders in Chinese, a little more softly than before. No, wait, wait. This little girl hasn't given us good reason to make her throw a tantrum just yet. Besides, this man doesn't even flinch. He's a fighter. Respectable. Lay off, you. Back the fuck up. We kill a coward first. I couldn't believe my ears. Was I really hearing everything he said right? Or had I just lost my mind with wishful thinking? No, he'd actually changed his mind. I saw it a second later when the killer backed up, bitter disappointment on his face, fidgeting with his outstretched garrote wire. Z motioned, 
waving his hand to the right. We'll go down the line. Choose the next man. Make this one bleed like the biker trash hogs they all are. Mercy wouldn't be so kind two times in a row. Wormwood? Worm? Fuck, fuck, fuck! Daddy went berserk, screaming as the killer lifted the skinny man's head up. Wormwood opened his mouth to beg, or else curse the man about to kill him. But he never got that far. The black dragon hovering over him pushed his wire deep into the biker's throat. I turned away as the brother died. He choked, sputtered, bled all over the place. The men down the line next to him screamed or cursed or shook like bombs about to go off while the demon killed him, just inches away, and they were all powerless to do anything. When the commotion finally died, I realized Z had gotten exactly what he wanted. My father faced the ground, several teardrops underneath him on the dirty floor. He'd made a terrible mistake, but he'd been so sure about double-crossing these assholes— and now they were going to kill all of us, slow and torturous. C wasn't kidding around. I'd only seen Daddy cry a couple times over the years when he was losing Mom. Now he did it again, except there wasn't any relief coming, no end to this nightmare, except for death. The Chinese mobster had ruined him, and that scared me more than anything. It would have sent me into another hysterical crying fit, if only I wasn't so achingly numb. Z's fingers trembled as he lowered his hand, probably drunk on triumph, the kind of glee a serial killer has when he's claimed a new victim. Take them all away and clean up this fucking mess, he said in Chinese, nodding at Wormwood's limp body, face down in his own blood. We're off to a good start. We can afford a few more days here. I came all the way from fucking Shanghai to have this foreign devil waste my time, try to kill me like a fool. This isn't just about making them all pay and making sure their stupid biker club never does this again. I want to have some fun. It didn't sound any less insane in Mandarin Chinese. I closed my eyes and tried not to panic, slowly counting as I heard them moving around us probably taking the five living club members back to their cage. When I finally looked up, Z crouched next to my father, his arm around him like an old friend ready to pass the bottle. This is how it works, Mr. Hardcock President. When we ask, you answer. Simple, Gil. Easy. Fuck. You. My father's blue eyes still reflected red murder revenge. Now, now, I'm going to kill more of your men, and I'm going to kill you. But every time you tell us the truth, you prevent us from putting little Miss Mathers under the wire instead. You're a sensible man, Z said softly. Surely you'd rather watch the men you call brothers die rather than your own flesh and blood, yes? I know how it is. I have a daughter, too. She would have been very sad if your little plot here had gone your way, and you'd kept me from ever coming home again. Lucky for us, you fucked up bad. And I'm going to make sure it's your little girl crying, instead of mine. Ellie, darling, fuck. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I wouldn't even listen to Daddy's apology even though he kept moaning it over and over until they dragged him away. If I heard him say it one more time with Wormwood's blood still tarnishing the ground, I swear I'd lose my mind. They threw me in an old shipping container with a bottle of water and a bucket to pee in. A few boxes were left to sit on, empty wooden crates just sturdy enough to support my weight. When I couldn't stand any more, I finally gave in and sat on them. What kind of illegal cargo had they held one time? Guns? Ammo? Drugs? The club had been involved in selling and smuggling all sorts of stuff over the years. Now the chickens had come home to roost, and they wouldn't stop until they'd pecked out the eyeballs of everyone I ever loved. I couldn't believe how dumb and stubborn I'd been. Jesus, how absolutely fucked in the head Daddy had been to think this was a good idea— Drawing the Chinese here to stab them in the back and gain... What? 
Exactly. I didn't even know. I regretted walking away from asphalt in the park. Not just because I missed his love, his touch, the way he faced down the world to keep me safe. I regretted it because Wormwood might be alive right now if I'd only told him the truth. He wouldn't have let this fly. He'd have called up his brothers in California the second he found out, brought them up here, and they'd crash right through the walls of this dirty warehouse. They could have wiped out the Chinese before they killed another Tacoma man wearing the grizzly's patch. They could have— Fuck it. What was the use? All of this would've, could've thinking wouldn't save me. I let my train of thought derail because it wasn't happening, however bad I hoped it might. If Asphalt didn't just decide to throw up his strong hands and walk away from all this, he'd have hit the nearest bar after everything that went down between us. And I couldn't blame him one bit. It started as a sham marriage, but I'd wanted to open up so badly— I should have told him everything, like I'd started to before he interrogated me, beginning with how badly I'd wanted us to be real. But I'd lied to him instead. I'd taken on this stupid obligation to my father's club, all on a dirty secret Daddy had kept from even me. And now I just might pay for it with my life. No clue how I slept, but I did. A day or two passed in that dirty, dark container— Pulling down my pants and carefully pissing in the bucket was humiliating enough. So was having to thank the bastards who came to feed me stale crackers a couple times a day. They wouldn't turn them over, or the fresh bottles of water that came with them, until I said thank you. And I did, pretending I didn't understand the vicious comments they made in Chinese between their laughter. Bitch thinks so much of herself, doesn't she? Let's bring her down. Z won't notice— there's nobody back here. Bet she sucks like a starving village whore. Hell, maybe the boss will let us fuck her in front of Daddy if the shithead keeps us waiting. Still no secrets. How many we gotta kill to loosen up his lips? Maybe if we hold her down, fuck her instead, let him hear her screams? Bitch is too polite. We'll play a game. First time she spits in our face and doesn't thank us for keeping her alive. We'll teach her a fucking lesson. I learned to smile real big and say thank you each and every time. Thank God there weren't very many of them. They only came twice a day. Somehow I walked on just enough eggshells to stop them from pushing me back inside the storage unit and closing the door behind them, leaving me alone with their dirty mafia cocks and savage threats. I ate and drank to stay alive. Same reason I covered my ears every evening— or what I thought was evening, when I heard distant voices, screams, howls, drowning in the unmistakable gurgle of human blood. They were still torturing Daddy and the brothers. Killing them. I wondered who was left. Jacko? Line? Herc? These men understood the risks of playing the outlaw game better than anyone— but nobody deserved to die with their hands bound while a bastard behind them slashed their throat. So weak, so cowardly, and so fucking brutal. I cried for them all. I prayed for my own miserable life and daddy's too, not caring about the fact that he'd put us here. I swore that if, by some crazy miracle, I ever got out of here alive, I'd find asphalt any way I could. Next time I grabbed him, and I wouldn't let go. I'd be the best old lady I could be to the only man who'd ever been completely straight with me, the man I knew I'd been born to meet. God, please, just one more chance. Don't take my love, my life, before I can confess it. Mom had always been more faithful than me. It hadn't saved her from dying once the cancer ate her up. No, but it had eased her pain. I was about to learn that sometimes when you pray hard enough, when nothing gets lost in translation, and luck is on your side, heaven and hell both answer at once. 8. Uncaged. Asphalt. Forty hours earlier. I needed a stiff goddamned drink after that shit in the park. 
I was still in shock, squeezing the bars of my bike as it rattled down the road so hard I let the force shake me numb. Didn't understand how the fuck she'd done it, but she had. My baby girl fucked away everything. Showed me she didn't really give a shit, that she wasn't my babe after all, that she put her old man's dangerous games ahead of common sense. Fuck, fuck, a thousand times, fuck! I'd have to tell the club now. Bring all the boys in to rain down hell on Tacoma, put a stop to whatever shit they were getting into with the Chinese. Had to move fast, too, before the motherfuckers ruined everything we'd fought for over the past year. Then I could deal with the mad bloodlust burning in my fists, the need to shatter the whole fucking world over Ellie Joe ripping out my heart. I found a little watering hole just outside town, recognized it from other runs, and I knew the owner had a loose affiliation with the club for years. No sooner than I burst in and the boy behind the bar saw my patch, he motioned me over to a corner stool and slammed a shot of good whiskey down in front of me. I took it down my gullet without a word, closing my eyes as that hot honey burn exploded in my guts. Thank fuck for booze. Jack, Jim, and Johnny had never betrayed me. Not like pussy had. I punched my empty glass down on the counter, making the only sound I needed for more than ripped out my phone while I waited. Yeah? Roman the Enforcer answered in his booming voice. Gonna need support from the guys up here after all, man. She wouldn't cooperate. Shit's coming down fast with the Chinese. Motherfucking imminent. What the fuck happened? I explained everything. Left out the part where I'd started to feel real fucking attached to Ellie Jo, when I'd stupidly believed she might really be my old lady instead of just being the woman I'd fucked before she fucked me over. She just took off with one of their prospects and you didn't stop them? I shrugged. You really want me going martyr alone in Tacoma? Roman growled his consideration on the other end of the line, and a sharp noise interrupted us. I heard his kid crying in the background. His girl Sally made some soft cooing noises to calm the boy down. Sorry. Yeah, brother, guess you're right. I'll get the boys together quick. Should get our asses up there by tomorrow evening. You keep your shit straight and try to get more intel. Find out if that bitch of a princess you married is just running or if she's trying to lure us into a trap. I knocked back my second shot while Roman put the phone down, his killer voice softening as he talked to his kid, his old lady. Something about that shit made me smile. Too bad it also made me rage, reminded me of all the shit I'd lost. No, the shit I'd never even had. Everything Ellie started to make me hope for before she flung it around, broke it, smashed it to smithereens. It's not like that, brother. She's a crafty little girl, being who she is, yeah, but she doesn't want any bloodshed. We both agreed on that before she stepped out. There's no fucking way she'd help her daddy draw us into a meat grinder. Wasn't sure why the fuck I bothered to defend her, but I did. Well, she's made her choice, and so is her old man. She's eaten up her goodwill, Roman thundered. Get moving. Find out what you can. The Prez won't want to put a hole through her chest if we can avoid it. Doesn't sound like we're going to be as lucky with the rest of those Tacoma fucks. I nodded, feeling my chest tighten. One more day in the life where the bloodshed didn't end. It never bothered me before, but for some shitty reason it did now. Take care of yourself and your family, brother. A man never knows how or when he's going to come back from the trenches every time we get ourselves into this shit. I meant it. Roman just chuckled, hungry as ever for raw violence. Becoming a family man had barely lessened his appetite for ripping fuckers' arms out of their sockets— though he was more careful to rein in those urges since we'd all nearly died in our shootout with the cartel a few months back. Worry about your own ass, hothead. Shit, you're usually itching to settle the score more than me. What's gotten into you? I held up my empty shot glass and studied the light streaming across it. I knew damned well what, or who, had gotten underneath my skin. That was for me. He didn't need to know it. I'd just given him all he needed for a club briefing. The giant who'd held me down and knocked me out cold on a couple occasions when I got out of line was the last brother I'd confess anything to. Nothing. Just being up here by myself in their fucking den, I guess. Don't worry about it. I'll get as much as I can out of the locals for you and the prez by the time you show up. I'll be ready. We'll be there in thirty hours. Thirty hours or so to get our shit together and ride. The line went dead. I pushed the phone back into my pocket and ordered one more shot to clear my fucking head. Once the poison wore off, I'd be back on the road. This time I'd be demanding answers, and I wasn't letting anybody blind me again. Gill's place was first one on the itinerary. 
She'd always run back there before when shit went raw. Daddy would probably be there to console her, tell her what a good girl she'd been to walk out on the bald-headed fuck who'd always been too bad for her. My body tightened, ready to tear open throats like a tiger. Didn't get any better as I rolled into our old neighborhood. Hit the brakes when I circled by my parents' place, now property of some young couple who'd probably make their kids a hundred times happier than I'd been. I let myself have one long glance at my home I'd left years ago, feeling the grim past staring out the windows, looking right at me. The fucks who'd bought my parents' place changed the color and the landscaping, but they couldn't do anything to banish the ghosts inside. I could still hear my folks bitching at each other before my old man walked out. Then the shitty soap operas and dog shows my ma used to watch, smoking and drinking herself to death. The woman put away more poison than half the guys I'd ever met in the club. She hadn't lasted more than a year or two after I'd gotten patched in in Blue Town, spent her last half year on this earth in a shitty fucking hospice, all she could afford on her meager bennies. I remembered how shell-shocked Ellie Jo used to look when she walked outside not long after her ma died. Saw the girl cry while she was alone at the bus stop several times while I played hooky at home and smoked in my room. How many times had I wanted to march out there, pull her into my arms, and squeeze her till all her tears stopped coming, if only for a day? Shit, how many times had I stared at her ass while she disappeared inside her house? How many fucking times had I thought about her later while I fucked the nameless sluts I started pulling as a prospect, the only good thing that came out of my time with the Tacoma Charter? Too many brutal memories in this old neighborhood. I sped the rest of the way to her doorstep, letting my engine roar loud and lonely. Maybe it was the jack in my system, or else the hole in my chest that bitch left behind when she walked away. It hit me hard to stop and stare up at her old man's porch, remembering the first kiss that hooked me forever. Even now, I'd kill a man to taste those lips. Preferably her old man, but fuck, anybody would do if it got me back in bed with that woman. I'd spill blood to feel her nipples go soft on my tongue, sink my teeth into her shoulder while her pussy clenched around me. I had to shake off the lust. Remember why the fuck I was standing here, stepping off my bike and pulling out my binoculars about a block up to take a good look at the house. The whole neighborhood was dead silent. I stood my ground and watched for a solid half hour, waiting for somebody to stagger out for some fresh air or a piss. Her old man always had a prospect or two hanging around, but I didn't see so much as the dot of a lit cigarette shining into the night. My girl had either avoided Daddy's place entirely, or else there was nobody home. Fuck it. I ran down the street and snuck near the back, climbing over the locked gate. There wasn't a bike in sight, the biggest sign yet the place was deserted. If Gil's boys were here, they'd be guarding the back door, the flimsy weak spot most homes had. With one hand on my gun, I slammed my boot across the knob. Fucking thing splintered with barely any effort. Nobody greeted me with a bullet or a blow to the head as I stepped inside. The interior was just as pitch black as the porch outside. I latched onto the adrenaline in my blood and didn't let my guard down, but I took a quick scan through the entire house. The basement was a little more interesting. A couple shotguns were laid out on a workbench, too clean and new to be antiques hanging out in Gill's place. Papers were strewn across the chipped table next to a couple hammers and a case of beer. I grabbed them and flicked on my lighter for some light. Holy shit! Couldn't stop the words when I saw what the fuck I had. It was some shit scrawled in black ink over a ledger with the Ivankov logo at the top. The Russian mobsters based around Chicago did business with us sometimes out west, usually smuggled their shit through Seattle with our blessing and a hefty protection tax. Chinese dealings ramping up in SeaTac, and they mean business. They'll hit your club hard if you don't hit the fuckers harder first. Fool them, play nice, then break their skulls open. We'd rather do business with your boys than the black dragon assholes any day. Lev. Shit was dated about a month ago. Snarling, I tore the corner, stuffing it into my pocket. The other shit was a mishmash of notes back and forth between Gill and some asshole in the Black Dragon mob. The lying Tacoma Prez acted real friendly, pretending he wanted to sit down for drinks and deals with the fuckers. I wanted to believe he did all this shit by paper like a hundred fucking years ago because the cock hanging out of his mouth was too big to talk. 
They flipped through more, taking it all in, quick little notes between Ellie's old man and some mafia fucker. Z. It all made sense. Finally. Gil hadn't turned rat. He wasn't the greedy asshole I'd thought, trying to make a special deal behind California's back with the goddamned Chinese. It was worse than that. The stupid, stupid, stupid motherfucker was trying to gut the Chinese all alone, and he dragged Ellie into it, too. Had to get this shit to the prez. There'd be time to ball the Russians out later for going to Gil first instead of Blackjack. Fuck. I had to save my girl. I tucked the rest of the papers underneath my arm and ran out of the house. Still didn't have a clue where those fuckers were, but I'd find them. Just hoped to hell I'd get there before I turned on the radio tomorrow and heard about a massacre with one dead blonde caught in it on the local news. Tacoma's clubhouse was almost as empty. When I rolled up, a couple scared-looking prospects pointed guns my way, hiding behind the gates. I marched up to the iron bars and put my hands on them, shoving my face through the middle. They nearly shit their pants. You're wearing the wrong bottom rocker, a kid named Carbon said, trying to sound tough. We're not letting you in. Don't give a shit if you're the asshole who married the Prez's daughter. Open the fuck up. The whole Redding crew's on its way and there's only two of you. Otherwise, you'd be calling for more guys when I'm standing on your doorstep like a fucking wolf. The two prospects looked at each other. The other one had smaller balls. His gun went down so fast his buddy swore, reluctantly walked over and pounded the switch for the gate. I waited while it slid open. Soon as I was inside, I put my arms around them both and shoved them to the fucking ground in one swift push. Ah, what the fuck? Carbon roared, squealing louder when I stomped on his leg. Hard enough to scare him, press his ass into line rather than do any real damage. Listen up, boys, both of you. Club rules say you're both with me now. You've been drafted. I'm guessing your officers are all M.I.A. That puts you under Redding's control, since I'm the only full-patch brother here. Brother? You? Fuck me! The other guy rolled, trying not to choke on the irony. Yeah, asshole, I growled. We'd better start acting like it, too. I'm guessing you want to earn your bottom rockers and save your boys. Can't say I give a fuck about your futures in this club, but my old lady's with your boys wherever the fuck they scampered off to. Here's how it's gonna go down. They didn't protest when I finally let them up. They took me inside the clubhouse and went to the bar. They spilled everything there. All they knew, anyway. I listened to them talk about the big raid, the dirty deal going down with the Chinese that wasn't really a deal. It was a goddamned ambush, just like I already knew. None of these boys could have been any older than twenty-one, about the same age I was when I took on the patch for life and drew my first blood for these colors. They'd both made the right choice, saved themselves from a blade in the guts. If Lady Luck decided to give us all a nice big kiss today, then they'd both have a long life of drinking and whoring ahead. I'd settle for undoing everything that happened yesterday at the park. As soon as backup came, we'd all be heading down to that warehouse where something had obviously gotten fucked up. They said their guys left hours ago and hadn't checked in since. I wasn't waiting to save my girl. Forget the divorce, forget disowning her, I hadn't meant any of that shit when she forced my hand. I'd win her back and make sure she knew her place forever this time. I'd tape her sweet lips shut if it saved her from ever risking her life again. And I'd also kill every last brain-dead sack of shit who dared to put her in danger, even her old man. Shit, especially her old man. Didn't care if the fuck was dead and I had to drag his ass up out of hell to do it. I'd make him pay for putting my woman's life on the line, so help me God. I hadn't been fully sober this long in years by the time I heard the roar of my brother's bikes. It felt like a fucking eternity waiting for them to show, and now that they were here, it was like a lightning bolt struck down my throat and got me moving. Fists at my sides, I marched out before they climbed off their bikes and started busting open the gate. Soon as they saw me coming, everybody relaxed, Roman especially. I motioned to Carbon, and he smashed his hand on the gate's button with a sour look on his face. It's clean. No need to do a sweep. I said, nodding at Blackjack. Just a couple prospects inside, and they're with us now. Come on, we can't waste another minute. Easy, son. Chances are the Chinese have already ambushed Gill and his men. We've got to make sure we aren't wandering into the same trap. Blackjack got off his bike and stormed past me, moving as fast as his old war wound in the leg would carry him. No way was he fucking serious, right? I wasn't going to sit down and rehash all the intel I'd already fed Roman. We'd wasted too much precious fucking time already. 
Ellie Joe could be rotting away in some goddamned pit for all I knew. I can't let her die with them, for fuck's sake! I started heading for my bike, pulled off just to the side. We've got to go now! The Chinese think they got the drop anyway, and they probably did with Tacoma. They won't see us coming. Let's— Prez is right. Easy. Roman slapped me on the shoulder and squeezed so hard it hurt. We can't just ride in there with our dicks hanging out. You're letting your emotion do too much talking, brother. It's gonna make you a dead man. Behind him, Brass and Rabbit nodded. Motherfuckers. All of them. I'd seen them working with the same manic energy boiling my blood when their girls were on the line. Yeah, the fucks were trying to do me a favor now, making sure cooler heads prevailed, but it sure as shit didn't feel like it. Asphalt, don't waste your energy taking swings at your brothers. The Prez stepped up, sensing the tension, looking like a wizard when the wind blew his long gray hair. Let's huddle, son. Ten minutes. Just one of our boys getting shot because we could have used our brains as one man too many, I say. And as long as I'm sporting a patch that says president, you better believe what I say in this club is law. Much as I didn't want to admit it, he was right. I tried to pay attention to everything coming out of the Prez's mouth for the next ten minutes, just like he'd promised. Too fucking bad my mind was anywhere but here. I couldn't stop thinking about Ellie Jo. Almost as much as I couldn't wait to throttle every last son of a bitch who dragged her into their damned mess. Blackjack rattled off some elaborate strategy like the sorcerer he was. I looked at the brothers one by one, sharing the same wicked energy brewing in their eyes. Once he was finished, the Prez gave the order and we got on our bikes. The two Tacoma prospects rode by my side, all the better to keep them in line if nerves got to them. No man ever forgets his first battle, and these poor fucks didn't have as much on the line as I did. My thoughts rambled like a goddamn freight train as we tore down the highway, weaving around cars, heading for the docks where the warehouse sat. Hang on, Ellie, baby, I'm coming. I'm never letting go again, no matter how many times you stab me through the heart. We're doing things different, babe, mark my word. I'm gonna save you, fuck you, and love you till disobeying me again is the last thing you've ever got on your mind. And if you don't like it, I don't care. I don't fucking care. You belong to me and you always will, even when I'm telling you don't like a goddamn fool. We're coming. You're coming home. Then I'm gonna make you come so hard on my dick I break every defiant little shred in your body. We knew the Tacoma boys had run into deep shit when we perched on the hill overlooking the warehouse district. Roman looked through his binoculars and grunted, muttered something about rows of abandoned bikes. He also said he saw a truck parked by the wall with blood all over the driver's seat. The lazy fucks hadn't bothered to clean up whatever the hell happened there. I helped the big guy pull the fat tube off his bike and start setting it up. I've never handled a fucking cannon before. Mortar, to be precise, the sort of portable shit gorillas used when they wanted to put some explosive teeth into their hit-and-run attacks. This one wasn't going to be blasting anything fatal, though. Once we had it together, the Prez pulled his smoke out of his mouth and stubbed it out on the ground. Blackjack looked at Brass, Rabbit, and the two prospects who'd rode up from Redding. Go! They rode down the hill like demons, doing several passes around the warehouse, careful to shoot at anything moving inside if it looked remotely Chinese. All hell broke loose when our group rounded the back. Orange fire exploded just ahead of my brother's bike, sending thick black smoke up into the sky above it. Roman's walkie-talkie hummed static screams and a raging curse that let us know our boys were still alive, even if they were busted up pretty bad. Fuck, fuck, fuck! I was already getting on my bike, the Tacoma boys at my side, before the Prez gave the order. We roared down the same slope as the others, but this time we made a fucking beeline for the center gate. The flash grenades Roman slung out of the mortar blew up a little bit ahead of us, just on the other side. Perfect fucking timing. About five Chinese assholes in suits came running out, guns drawn, just in time to get blinded. I didn't even duck as all three of us crashed through the gate, flattening it underneath our bikes. Shots were already going off behind the warehouse, off to the side where our boys had driven into the big blast. Fucking shit. The prospects at my side didn't have my aim. Most of their shots went all over the fucking place, but they managed to pin the mafia assholes down. A strange calm came over me, allowed me to put all five of them down like dogs with neat shots to their rotten heads. I didn't kill my bike and step off it till I saw them stop moving. Then I charged, yelling after those fucks behind me to follow, hoping that shit Roman had on the hill wouldn't lob another flash bomb and blind us. 
No way of knowing how many assholes we'd taken out. The shooting off to the side was dying down. I hit the service door and found it locked. I swore, gave it my best kick and cursed bloody murder when it didn't budge an inch, hellfire running up my leg. Get the fuck over here and fry this thing open, assholes! I screamed at the prospects. Gotta see what the hell's going on around the corner. Gotta— Another blast cut me off in mid-speech. We weren't the only ones who'd brought a few bombs to the fight. The latest blast was just a distraction. No sooner than I looked at the latest orange plume rising high into the air, a van came tearing out the opposite direction. Fucking thing grazed Carbon's bike and nearly took out mine before it swerved. It wasn't slowing down, not when the driver knew there was hell behind him. It went tearing through the gate we'd knocked down, trying to catch it, but the motherfucker was just too fast. I prayed to whatever gods had saved this club's ass in the past that Roman would take out their tires and cut them down before they got away. I prayed even harder that Ellie wasn't inside, that we weren't too late to save her. We wouldn't be wasting our time here, killing assholes who were nothing but a distraction while the real bastards escaped. Too much shit was happening at once. The prospects busted open the door to the warehouse just as two more bikes rolled up, a very dazed and cut veep with Rabbit at his side. Relief rolled through me to see them safe. Thank fuck for small favors. They jumped off their rides and followed behind us as we pushed our way inside, guns drawn. I almost puked when we walked through the dirty old cafeteria. It smelled like a fucking slaughterhouse. We saw why about a second later. Men with bloody Grizzlies MC cuts were stacked up in a pile, dismembered and rotting. Holy fucking shit, Brass swore, smacking himself across the forehead in disbelief. That's gotta be half the Tacoma Charter. The prospects lost it. They both dropped to the knees and barfed their guts out, Carbon and the other guy alternating, holding each other. I couldn't even roll my eyes. I'd expected some nasty shit before, but I'd never seen a fucking abomination like this. Forced myself to keep moving. Had to. Not till I had Ellie home and safe. As the only asshole who wasn't paralyzed, I walked up and started combing through the dead bodies, holding my breath while I shoved severed limbs aside. All the guys had their throats cut, and it looked like the chop shop came later. I held my breath, desperate to see whether or not there was a woman in there, too. Had to know if Ellie was with them, even if it was going to kill me as dead as all these poor sorry bastards. Christ, bro, what the fuck are you— Rabbit grabbed me by the shoulder and flung me around just as I finished. She's not here, I said, trying not to shake. Then the brief flash of giddy joy I had hit the fucking wall. Oh, fuck! The van! Yeah, shit. We better check with Roman. It's all up to him now. Brass took one look at the gory mess I'd just combed through and shook his head. Fuck. We're gonna hang this Z asshole from his goddamned balls when we catch him. I can't believe this shit. All these guys with the Washington patch might be fuckers, but they're our fuckers. We'd better get our vengeance going fast, Rabbit snapped. We've got about five minutes to light this place up before every cop in the whole fucking Seattle area sees the smoke and descends on this place. I'd be surprised if some asshole hasn't phoned it in yet. Shit. He was absolutely right. Grizzlies always made a policy to cover up our battles, and we didn't have much time at all to burn this place to the ground. At least it would buy the club some time to bribe the investigators who'd find what was left and save everybody in Washington from Fed snooping, if there still was a Tacoma charter worth saving. We have to find Ellie. We gotta comb this place before it burns the fuck down. I'm not waiting up. Asphalt! Brass swore behind me as I took off, heading out of the cafeteria through the old swinging door. God damn it! I couldn't get the van out of my skull. If they'd carted her away for more torture, more brutality, then I'd make theirs a thousand times worse. I tore through the warehouse, ignoring the pungent smoke beginning to drift through the empty spaces, all the signs this place was primed to go up like an exploding fucking blimp. Ellie! Ellie Joe! I screamed my lungs out, hands around my mouth to project it. I stopped, held my breath, listening harder than I ever had in my fucking life. Somebody tried to scream, except they couldn't. Their voice stopped like they'd been gagged. I kicked aside a few old crates stacked against a storage container, mercifully empty, and found three Tacoma boys hogtied with dirty socks stuffed in their mouths. Fuck. Reaching for the one-eyed Jack first, I tore off his gag and yanked him to his feet, pulling my switchblade to his bound hands to get the rope off. It was their veep, 
that battle-hardened, scruffy motherfucker with one eye named Line. "'Where's Ellie Joe?' I screamed in his face. "'Ellie! What the fuck? We've got to go after the van, brother. The Chinese took off with our fucking prez and—' I punched him clean across the face. Fucker was too dazed to fight back. I didn't give a shit about what they'd done to these poor bastards or even the fact that asshole Gil was missing. If the next few words out of his mouth didn't have to do with my girl, I'd knock him out cold. Ellie Joe took up a hundred percent of the space in my fucking mind, and she wouldn't quit till I had her in my arms. Is she with them? Did those fucks cart her away, too? Line shook his head. Storage. We need to get the fuck out of here. He pointed with his free hand, beginning to work on cutting his brothers loose with the other. He'd ripped the blade right out of my hands, and I didn't even give a shit. I ran up the small ramp to the metal box and began pounding with both fists. Ellie? Ellie! I shut my ass up for two seconds and heard a tiny muffled whimper. Fuck, baby, is that you? I wasn't waiting to find out. The fucking door was locked when I jerked it, a cheap-ass padlock holding it shut. Guys behind me started to cough as thick gray smoke blanketed us. The fire under my ass to get her the fuck out of there burned a hundred times hotter. Grabbing an empty rusted barrel next to the storage tank, I went apeshit, bashing it against the lock till the impact practically shattered my bones. Had to hit it about ten times before the shitty plastic finally cracked and I could reach inside, jerking on the guts. Tore them right out. The newly freed Tacoma boys helped me pull. Fucking thing finally snapped and I jerked open the huge double doors, rushing into the blackness. What I saw inside should have stopped any sane man in his tracks. Lucky me, whatever sanity I had left went flying out the fucking window about ten minutes ago. My baby girl was slumped in the corner, her hands bound, a gag in her mouth, just like the others. I didn't understand why the fucker jeans were down around her ankles till I saw the piece of shit next to her. Ellie looked up from her stupor, saw me, and started screaming through the gag. She motioned with her whole body, down at the man on the ground, rolling around on the rusty floor with his hand between his legs. Didn't take a genius to figure out she'd kicked this fuckhead in the ball so hard she'd probably ruined him for sex forever. And if she didn't, well, fuck, I was gonna finish the job. I stepped on his gun as I approached, then kicked it across the floor where he couldn't reach. Mafia asshole must have lost it and been too preoccupied with blinding pain to pick it up, and now he never would. I didn't even bother claiming the gun for myself. I had everything I needed right behind me. I rushed out between the bewildered-looking guys and pushed them aside a second later, a heavy metal barrel in my arms. Ellie Jo started screaming again through her gag when she saw the storm coming. She went silent, and so did the whole damned world when I stood over the groaning mafia asshole and slammed it into his head. His rotten skull caved with one crack. Not good enough. Not even fucking close. I knocked his goddamned teeth out and probably his eyeballs, too, on the second blow— and it only got worse from there. By the time the Tacoma Grizzlies shook off their stupor enough to grab me and I heard Brass's pissed-off voice behind me, I was a gibbering mess, my whole body burning on pure rage as I turned Mafia assholes' brains into cherry mush. Too fucking bad a man only gets one death. If I could have killed him a hundred more times, I would have. When they finally slammed me against the wall so hard the whole storage shed echoed, what little I'd left attached to his neck couldn't be called a head in any proper sense. Let me up, you fucks! I have to set her free! Calm down, brother. Rabbit's working on it. Brass covered his mouth with his sleeve and coughed. Shit! Fuck! We've got to grab the girl and get the fuck out of here! He turned to line. Was anybody else here tied up with you assholes? The Tacoma VP shook his head. I looked at my VP and told him the same, said these boys were the only ones I'd found. We knew exactly what happened to the others. The nasty pile of carved-up brothers we'd found in the cafeteria told the entire story. The fuckers let me down just in time for Rabbit to finish cutting my girl loose. I knocked one of the Tacoma assholes flat in my rush to get to her. Fuck, baby, you're safe now. Rabbit jumped out of my way as I pulled her into my embrace, sweeping low, reaching for her jeans. I pulled them back up where they belonged with a growl. No man ever undressed her except me, and if I hadn't already brutally killed the motherfucker who'd tried, I'd have done it all over again. God, I thought I'd never see you again she moaned, burying her face in my chest. When she lifted it a second later, we both started coughing. Fuck. The smoke. It wasn't getting any thinner. Come on! Brass's voice rang out through the haze. Let's move our asses out, right fucking now, before we all suffocate. This place'll be crawling with cops any minute, too. 
Ellie Jo heard the man. She tried to follow me when I jerked on her hand, guiding her over the mess of the dead mobster on the ground, but she tripped on the fuckhead's dead body. I spun, caught her, and swept her into my arms. I wasn't taking any chances. I wouldn't let go, despite her protests. Just threw her arms around my neck and carried her all the way out, crushing her face into my chest when we went through the thickest smoke, holding my breath till my eyes bulged. A couple of beat-up Tacoma guys staggered through it and almost collapsed. Rabbit helped them up, and we headed toward the service door, hoping none of the fires had fucked up our bikes. Fresh air never tasted so sweet. I threw my girl on the back of my bike while the others got themselves set for the ride out. Sirens screamed in the distance. Big, loud fire engines, judging by the sounds of it. The Veep wasn't kidding. Cops would be close behind the fire trucks if they weren't already. Shit! Blackjack and Roman gestured wildly by the gates. The look on their face said it all. Move your asses. We had to get the fuck out. There was no dealing with any of this shit the proper way, covering it all up. The club was going to have to pull every damned string in the book to get out of this, especially when the officers found human bones inside. You hang on tight, woman, I told her, tucking her arms around me. We're going to be home soon, Ellie Joe. Where's my dad? She said, pressing her face into my shoulder as I started my bike. You didn't find him, did you? Oh, God, he's not... Dead, is he? I shook my head. Don't know, babe. There wasn't any sign of him in there. You and three Tacoma boys were the only ones we found alive. We'll sort all that out later. Promise. My words weren't much comfort. She cried for the first solid mile after me and my brothers crashed over the flattened gate. About a mile later, we needed a whole different kind of comforting for the world-shattering blast that billowed up behind us. Thought a stick of fucking dynamite blew out my eardrums. Rabbit almost wrecked his bike, regaining control a second before he smashed into a concrete divider. The lone civilian bread truck in front of us came to a total stop, and we all weaved around it in the nick of time. Ellie fought to keep one arm around my waist, covering her damaged ear with the other. Her eyes in my mirrors were just as bewildered as mine, wondering if the fucking world just ended. It hadn't, but the warehouse was toast. Whatever the fuck caught fire in there was big enough to leave a steaming crater and a small mushroom cloud that lingered in the sky for half a minute. Then the hot orange death faded to nothing. At the next light I caught Blackjack's reflection. The Prez looked like he didn't know whether to smile or grimace. That explosion had probably blown the fuck out of everything there that would have raised too many uncomfortable questions, but the Tacoma boy still had the club's name on this property. We'd be answering questions about hazardous substances and weapons of mass destruction— rather than the chopped-up dead men and the mafia asshole whose head I've obliterated. Fuck. By the time we got to the Tacoma Clubhouse, none of that shit mattered. The prospects who'd ridden out with my boys got off their bikes and hugged their full-patch brothers. The club had taken a lot of casualties, and with their prez MIA, they'd lost their head, too. All the Redding brothers began to huddle, an improvised debriefing that would have to wait for me. I had bigger business right behind me. I helped Ellie off the bike and pulled her helmet away. Then I hugged her so fucking hard it would have hurt if both of us weren't running on raw, rip-your-guts-out passion. Fuck, I love you, babe. Forget everything I said in that goddamn park. You're still my old lady. You're my bride, now and fucking forever. You're my woman, always mine, and that's the way it always will be. Her eyes were so dark, haunted in a way that made me wonder if the Chinese had stolen part of her forever but those blues lit up when I ran my hand over her face, amazed how her skin stayed so soft despite going through sheer hell. I'm sorry, Asphalt. Jesus, God, I'm so fucking sorry. She cracked. All my brothers stopped mid-sentence and watched as she poured her grief out all over me. I just held her, kissed her on the forehead, ready to keep her in my arms till she believed everything I told her next. Forget the past, babe. Whatever the fuck happened between us before, that was club politics. Club business that should never involve an old lady and her man. Should never land her in a pack of fucking jackals, neither. Listen good, because I'm about to tell you how it's gonna be from here on out. I waited till those bright blue eyes looked into mine. You're home when you're with me. You're safe when you're with me. You're my whole goddamned world, and that's never gonna change. I don't let my world burn or bleed out on the ground. I paused, brushing away more tears rolling down her cheeks. Tell me you understand. Everything's different now, the way it should have been from the start. That's a fucking promise. Asphalt. 
She just nodded, too fucked for words. I looked at my boys. They just nodded as I escorted her inside, walking into the clubhouse the Tacoma boys had just unlocked. I'd find a place to lay her down, get her some decent grub, make sure she got some sleep. Then me and the boys would figure out how we'd track down the Chinese and nail their dicks to the closest fucking wall. If her old man was still alive, he deserved the same treatment. That stupid shit-for-brains motherfucker deserved a bullet in the brain for getting half his club killed. As far as I was concerned, the asshole deserved worse for putting my girl in danger with his bullshit. Ellie Jo wouldn't ever work for the club and put her ass on the line again. Not for any charter. She lived for me now, and as long as she did, I'd make damn sure she never had to suffer, bleed, or shake for this patch. It took forever to calm her down. I made her drink water like a damned fish, and she heaved it up right away. I helped her sip more gently on the second go. I talked to her the same way I did all those years ago when I saw her with that flattened bike tire by the road, about to go to tears from being so damned frustrated. Except this time I put my lips on hers, stopping her before she could spill more tears with my kiss. She didn't resist. I found her a cot and pulled her into it, throwing my arms around her. I held her and rocked her the way I'd wanted to since I put my brand on her skin. This is all my fault, she whispered. Everything. Babe, kindly shut the fuck up. You know that isn't true, I growled, doubling down on silencing her with another kiss. This is your old man's fault. He tried to do dirty deals with the Chinese behind Mother Charter's back, got half his guys killed, and almost got you fucked over on top of it. If we manage to track his ass down, he's gonna pay. Asphalt, no, she snapped, shaking in my arms. You don't understand. It wasn't like that. Yes, he did wrong. He never meant to do a real deal with them from everything I've gathered. He tried to draw them into a trap. He was going to take care of them before they became a problem for everyone, but they saw it coming. Yeah, Daddy misstepped, trying to kill them first and underestimating them. But you didn't see the things they did, the way they slashed men's throats in front of us. She closed her eyes. I could sense the painful memories boiling her from the inside out. That shit never went away. It would fade over the years, but a man never forgets blood and death. Couldn't be any different for a woman. Fuck. If I could have drawn all that poison into me, wiping it from her precious brain, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Too bad life was never so magical or so easy. Quiet, babe. You need rest. There's no point thinking about that shit now. Yeah, right. The expression in her face told me how stupid I was for telling her to shut down, as if it was the easiest thing in the world. We'll bring your old man home one way or another, I said. That's up to me in the club, not your worry. He suffered enough. Please, don't kill him or hurt him any more if you do find him. I swear he doesn't deserve what they've done to him. I wasn't going to debate. Honestly, imagining Gil getting tortured a hundred different ways didn't bother me. The motherfucker deserved it for the mistakes he'd made. He'd flushed a solid twenty years leading his charter down the damned drain by getting so many of his boys killed with his half-cocked ambush plot. But having Ellie there, too, subjecting her to the same savage shit the dragons cooked up? Fuck! Maybe this Z asshole deserved to die a little more than her old man. Also, rogues or not, the Tacoma Charter still wore our patch. They were Redding's cousins in the Grizzlies' MC. No assholes came into our territory and hacked brothers to pieces like some medieval shit without paying heavy. Every last dragon was gonna die terrible when we had our reckoning. I stuffed my desire to say more bad shit about her old man down my throat. She kept crying, and I kissed away the tears, whispering how she'd always be okay in these arms. Just when she started to drift off, I rolled her over gently and pulled down her shirt. Took a good long look at the property of asphalt brand I'd put on her not so long ago, when she'd fought me all the way. That ink meant everything. As long as she wore it, I'd make damn sure I lived by my word— and she never had good reason to bawl her eyes out again. I closed the door gently behind me and found the brothers waiting by the bar. When Blackjack saw me, he stood up and walked straight into Tacoma's meeting room. We all understood, and everybody followed. Even the Tacoma boys didn't protest. That line asshole hadn't made a peep about us taking over. He must have realized how bad his M.I.A. pres had fucked his club over. 
Blackjack stood till everybody else was in their seats. Finally, the prez sank down in Gill's beat-up leather chair at the head of the table, folded his arms, and looked right at me. What did she tell you? Nothing we didn't already know from the papers I found at her old house. Tacoma wanted to go rogue and wipe the dragons out before the rest of the club got wise to it. The Chinese were a lot wiser to their prez being a two-timing fucking idiot. That's my prez you're talking about, Lyne's fist hit the table. For fuck's sake, we don't even know if he's breathing or not, and you're all shitting on his grave. So much for the hour or two of brotherly love we'd had between charters. The Tacoma boys sat next to their veep on one side of the table, sizing us up, looking like they were ready to spit nails. Every Redding brother in the room bristled, except for Blackjack. He wore the same iron calm in his face we'd seen a thousand times, awesome and scary as shit simultaneously. The Prez stood up, shook off the pain in his bad leg, and walked over to Line and his crew. Roman's arms flexed next to me. His fists were more than ready to crack heads if they were stupid enough to try anything on our boss, the same man everybody in this club owed top allegiance. Asphalt's right, Blackjack said coldly. Gill didn't have to go charging into Hell's Mouth after he got his little note from the Russians, did he? Redding, Klamath, and Portland would have been behind you. We could have dealt with them on our terms in massive numbers. We would have wiped them out without losing a single man. Lyons snorted, trying to act tough, but he couldn't even look at our prez. Gutless motherfucker. You don't know that, Blackjack. And shit, it's still no excuse for me and my guys to sit here and listen to your boys mouth off about our prez trying to do good with the least damage possible. He was working for the whole club, damn it. Honest. He deserves a little respect. The club? What about Ellie Joe? I jumped out of my seat and almost hit the ceiling. That fucking dumb shit almost got my girl killed. You were there when we found her. Would have gotten that mafia asshole's dick between her legs if she hadn't kicked his balls off, and you've got the nerve to stand here and bitch about respecting Gil? Fuck! That's enough, son, the prez snapped. Then I felt Roman's huge hand on my arm. I looked at the giant and he shook his head, urging me to sit the hell down. Thing is, Blackjack began, pulling out a smoke and stuffing it in his lips. You boys have a point, too. This club's all about respect, and that's got nothing to do with Gil. We all respect these colors. He stopped, took his cig out of his mouth, and nodded at the huge Grizzlies MC banner draped across the wall. Most clubhouses had one, the same roaring bear on our patch in the middle, deadly as a modern pirate flag. The minute we stop respecting the bears when we go to pieces, every charter winds up at each other's throat if there's no brotherhood, no strength in numbers, no common cause. That won't happen on my watch. Everybody in the room watched as he lifted his cig to his mouth and took a long pull. He made a show of turning his head away and letting smoke roll out his mouth when his lungs were full, intentionally not blowing it in one eye's face. We'll find Gil because we need to find the Black Dragons. Nobody fucks with this club, he growled. If we let them dismember the Tacoma Charter and hold a president hostage, however much he deserves it, we'll have every other group breathing down our necks in a few months. Japanese, Irish, Russians, Mexican cartel. Hell, even the little shit-stained MCs down in Dixie like the dead hands and the pistols will come gunning for their piece of the bear. It'll be open season on everybody sitting in these chairs. Killing your boys and taking Gil away in that van was a kick in the balls, no bones about it. We're not gonna fucking take it. Lyne's fists were clenched so tight on the table his knuckles went white. He restrained himself, just listening. Smart man. Before the prez was done, I saw a hot tear spill a jagged path down Line's cheek, falling from his good eye. I want everybody in this room to stand up and shake hands. Nobody moved. The prez narrowed his eyes and looked at us. You heard me. Blackjack waved us up with one hand. If any one of you gets the urge to knife another man wearing your patch, you're helping the dragons. You'll be treated like the traitorous fucking rat you are. Until we've got Gil back here and we're dealing with him our way, until we've killed every last one of the men who piled up severed bodies wearing Tacoma cuts like trash, no man in this room has any reason to hurt his brother. None. Fucking shit. The man talked too much sense for his own good. Sometimes it cut through our guts like a dagger. Brass nodded and stood up first. We all watched as he walked over to Carvin, the Tacoma prospect. The lean kid stood up and shook when our veep gave him the most aggressive, lung-crushing hug I'd ever seen. Roman, Rabbit, they all did the same. 
Even Blackjack embraced one of the full-patched Tacoma guys we'd rescued. I was the last one standing, looking at Line across the room. He started walking toward me, and I pinched fists so hard I thought my fingers would rupture like overcooked sausages. The Tacoma VP came to a stop in front of me and flashed me a viper's smile. I threw my arms around him, and we wrestled right there, trying to see who could crush out the other man's breath the fastest. In the end, I let him think he won. This brother was a damn fool for following Gil off the cliff and nearly losing his life over it. But he wasn't Ellie's old man, the real SOB who'd stolen her away from me. Gil did that with his fucked-up failure of a plot. So did the Chinese when they'd held her, tortured her, left her with some pitch-black poison memories I'd have to spend weeks fucking out of her sweet head. Lyon and his crew didn't deserve to have the life choked out of them for obeying orders and putting my woman in peril. I knew exactly who did. And once I found those motherfuckers, they were all as good as dead. 9. Sweet Mercy, Ellie Jo The devil in my dream screamed over the sound of gunfire, plus an explosion that sounded like it just ate half the world. All Mandarin, all wicked words I wish I didn't understand— you're going to come with me, little girl, just as soon as you're finished coming on my cock. It's a quickie, you and me. You know how many hours I've been dreaming about tasting this pussy, finding out how loud you scream. I never had American pussy before, and I'm going to ruin it. He stared at me in the dark metal box, his eyes flaming animal lust. Z's followers were just as insane as their leader. Maybe it was the adrenaline pounding through my veins, or the fact that the demons hadn't even brought me breakfast. I barely knew what was happening when instinct grabbed me by the throat and slammed me down. I couldn't let this happen without a fight. I had to stop it, even if it meant the end of me. I waited until he started pulling down my jeans before I kicked. Hard. My foot flew harder than I'd ever moved in my life. Hard as I wanted to live— to see Asphalt and Daddy again, to avoid being used and abused in this stinking shipping container while everything went to hell around us. The Mafia man's eyes rolled back in agony as my shoe destroyed his balls. He hit the ground, groaning, clutching his gun until his fingers gave up and dropped it at his side. Familiar voices started screaming, someone pounded at the door, and I watched it pull aside on its rusty hinges. The love of my life stepped inside, obliterating the doubt and the mean words we'd exchanged at the park. I knew I'd be saved. Asphalt won my heart, my body, and a piece of my soul. Then I woke up. I should have relished being safe and sound, alive with my man. Part of me did, certainly, but it wasn't over. God Almighty, it wasn't fucking over. I had to crawl out of my cot and find out what happened to my father before I'd ever have a peaceful night's sleep again. A shower sounded like a good start. I walked into the tiny, grimy bathroom attached to the club room and stripped. Compared to the small, dirty space where I'd spent the last few days, it seemed like a five-star hotel's bathroom. Even in the run-down shower stall, it was a relief to have the filth stripped off my body by cold water. At one point halfway through, I slapped the cracked wall tile with both hands and held myself there, crying out at everything. If it hadn't been for asphalt, I would have been a goner. Beaten, raped, dead. I couldn't forget the insane explosion that ripped through the old warehouse while we raced away. Easily big enough to incinerate me and my would-be rapist— assuming he didn't fight through the blinding pain I'd inflicted on his balls and kill me first. I turned off the water and stepped out. My reflection drew my eyes, and I hated it. I couldn't stop staring at the screwed-up girl in the mirror, one who'd finally been hit by the life she'd tried to escape after all these years. Sure, I desperately wanted to see my father alive again, but only so I could slap him across the face. I didn't deserve this— Nobody did. He'd put me in mortal danger, gotten his men killed, 
and almost got the love of my life murdered on top of it. Something changed when I was locked in that dirty, claustrophobic box. I reached up and touched the faded scratch on my cheek, one left by Z that first evening, when he'd gotten up in my face, rough and menacing. What the hell have I become? There wasn't time to ponder. A loud knock on the little door nearly caused me to jump out of my skin. What? Babe, you awake? Asphalt's voice had that concerned edge in it that turned my heart to butter. Pausing to wrap a towel around myself, I flung it open, and his arms were instantly around me, warm, loving, reassuring in all the right ways. Fuck. I'm sorry I had to be gone so long. We were talking, me and the boys, figuring out how we're gonna hash out this shit with the Chinese. Kill them, I said. Every last one. I don't care how, as long as you come home alive and bring Daddy back, too. I'll bring him home, Elbel. Me and the boys are real interested in dealing with his sorry ass for what he's done. We'll... I couldn't take the animosity. Not right now. I stood on the tips of my toes and shut him up, pushing my lips against his, hot and eager. Asphalt growled into my mouth. His hands stiffened, caressing their way down my body. He grabbed the towel and pushed it down to the floor, then shifted his hands to my bare ass. One fierce squeeze of those hands made me forget everything. Sex wouldn't be the answer forever, but today... I really needed to be fucked. He could take me away from everything, the killers I'd just escaped, all the ways I imagined they were torturing my father, the near certainty that the Reading Charter would end up destroying him if the Chinese didn't do it first. God, I missed you, I hissed, dragging my fingers along his back. I scratched at his cut, straight across the bare patch and his bottom rocker, the symbol I'd come to love and hate in my sick, twisted life. Babe, you don't know the half of it. Get back in the cot, and I'll hold you till you sleep. No. I put one hand on the back of his huge neck and held it, forcing him to look at me. Don't leave me this time. Not tonight. I need you, and I need it so fucking bad. His dark green eyes flickered, they moved in the whites of his eyes like jade pendulums, drinking me in, battling his vow to me against his oath to the club. Fuck. One word and a hand on my wrist told me who'd won. He practically carried me to the flimsy cot and threw me down. He pushed me onto it, holding me down with his weight, tearing off his clothes. His lips, tongue, and teeth teased down my shoulder, my back, stopping near the spot where I'd had his name inked on me forever. Asphalt pulled me up, and I moaned when I felt his naked torso on my back, the hardness he had between his legs, raging when he rubbed it against my ass cheeks. You're ready to give me your full attention, Ellie Jo. Tonight it's just you and me, nothing else. You need it? I need to know I'm the only fucking thing on your mind. Nothing else deserves a shred of your attention except my dick. Nobody else is going to give you this. He rubbed up and down my ass, then angled his cock close to my pussy, teasing me. I shook as he pulled me up on all fours, making the position to take me deep. I wanted to shake and die in this pleasure. I wanted to be with him. But those thoughts... Those nightmares I'd just woke from? They wouldn't stop coming. Closing my eyes tight, I tried to lie. I'm here for you, baby. Only you. Give me everything. Please. Snarling, he fisted my hair. He tugged it, jerking my head around until his lips were against my ear. No. Not till I can believe there's nothing on your mind except the dick that's about to fuck you senseless. I love you so fucking much, babe, and I'm a greedy SOB. You're mine. Only mine. I heard him, but I didn't know what he meant, didn't really know, until his fingers pushed between my thighs. He shoved two fingers deep and held them in me, covering my clit with his thumb. 
Oh, Jesus, I gasped, arching my back. Fuck, Asphalt. Yeah. Yeah, he repeated, quickening the loops his thumb circled, digging into my clit in a hard, steady burn. You whimper like that a couple more times. Maybe we'll be getting somewhere. His fingers moved inside me. My hips bounced back, caressing the full, magnificent length of his cock. The guttural thunder leaving his throat vibrated in my bones, and I smiled. There was something beautiful about being able to turn him on, even in this fucked-up state. I knew you'd come for me. Never doubted it. Those words we had before were tough, and I screwed you over by listening to Daddy like a stupid little girl. But I knew it wouldn't ruin this asphalt, this strange and wonderful thing we've built. Austin. What? What? I moaned, fighting for words through another full pussy stroke of his fingers, wondering if I'd hurt him right. In this bed, you call me by my rightful name, the one that always loved you, babe, the one that watched you growing up and came hard as fucking diamond to you instead of any lesser slut. Shit, I don't give a fuck what you say. Just as long as you know who owns this now, who's gonna own it till you take your last breath? Austin. It sounded so soft and alien after everything that happened. I'd used his name before as a curse, trying to get under his skin. Now I whimpered it like a lover, especially when he rewarded me with more fingers, another kiss, and a quicker, dizzying lap around my clit. Come for me, he growled crushing his lips down on mine. And I did. I came with my entire body into his hand, sobbing, grunting, spilling out my pain, my love, my heartache. He wrapped his free hand around my waist and kept his lips on mine. Asphalt swallowed everything, twining my twitching tongue with his, loosening his pressure when I started coming back to earth. Tears were still rolling down my cheeks when he finally pulled his fingers out, and he turned his mouth to the nape of my neck, gliding down in soft, gentle kisses. No, I don't deserve this, I whispered. Not after how I treated you. He stopped, his muscles tensed around me. Grabbing my chin, he jerked my face until we locked eyes. Babe, what you deserve tonight is exactly what I'm giving you. His green eyes blazed, turning tender lover into manic killer. I knew how badly I was fucked when that actually turned me on, turned everything below my waist to instant jelly. I wasn't fucking around when I told you earlier, I need all of you tonight. You're mine, woman, and I'm yours too. It's you and me here, the rest of the universe be fucked. And babe, I'm gonna fuck the ever-living shit out of you. Nothing barred. Oh, it shouldn't feel this delicious, not after what I just went through. Oh, but it did. He pushed inside me without a second warning. Pleasure overwhelmed me, unexpected and molten hot. I arched my back and gripped the thin sheets underneath me for support. Oh, my God. All the shit that happened before. He growled, nipping at my ear as his cock pulled back, slamming into me deeper than before. Gone. His hand moved up, pausing to maul my breasts before moving up to my throat. He held me in a gentle but not-so-gentle grip, the kind that said he'd love me and destroy me all at once. The same grip I needed just then. All that shit we spat out our mouths, going at each other like mortal fucking enemies. His cock thrust deeper, harder, faster, driving me out of my mind. Gone. Our breath came in long, ragged puffs. My fingers scratched, tore, ripped at the sheets until I couldn't even feel them any more. Austin, don't stop. No. Not till every last ounce of painful shit in your life's a goddamned memory, babe. Told you, I'm fucking out everything. Killing it by making you come so hard— you're blind to all the darkness. His thrusts quickened, rocking the cot between us. It might give out, and I didn't care. 
Hell, I couldn't focus on anything except the lighting building around his cock, my pussy coiling around him, just a few more thrusts from sweet release. I love this life when we're in bed. I love this dick. I love you, Asphalt. A long, uninterrupted growl poured out of his mouth. Long, punishing strokes filled me over and over again, so hard, so loving, he shook my entire body. My breasts swung beneath me, and he reached between my legs, found my clit, and added that miracle thumb to the maelstrom of his cock. I'm telling you now, and I'm telling you a thousand times, Ellie Joe, he said, his voice starting to crackle like static from the pleasure ripping through him. You are mine. Every last atom of shit that ever makes you doubt it, gone, now and fucking forever. And you'll know it when you pass the fuck out from coming on my cock. I lost it then. We lost it together. My pussy clenched his cock so hard I screamed. I came, feeling him stiffen, sputter, and add his heat to mine. Asphalt seed pumped deep and hot, filled me until I overflowed. We'd fused our love and hate. Maybe we fucked it away, too, a healing fuck, just like he'd said. When he pulled out, he was still hard. He flopped on the cot and pulled me on top of him. For the first time, I rode him with everything as his wife, his old lady, rather than the bitch keeping secrets. Fuck, babe, fuck. Just like that. Don't you stop for all the diamonds in the world, all the blood in the ocean. Love you from the tips of your toes to your ears, and everything in between. Really fucking love this pussy, too, and I'm gonna find out how much cum she can take. The second time I came... Impaled on his cock, I couldn't even scream his name. I was too busy smiling, breathless and happy, numb to everything except this beautiful moment with my outlaw husband. There'd always be more out there, waiting to hurt me. It could wait. We were too busy reconnecting, or maybe connecting for the first time. He fucked me like the big, powerful, unstoppable badass he was— but I'd gotten a little of his spark. Nothing was keeping me from his flesh tonight. He'd ripped me wide open with soft, honest words and furious kisses. I might bleed out and die a little before dawn, but I'd never die alone, without love. Not tonight, not tomorrow, not ever again. A couple days passed. Asphalt practically kept me under lock and key, bringing me food and fresh clothes, telling me to sleep. I spent so many hours in the cot I didn't know how I'd ever sleep again. I left my room and walked into the empty bar, looking for something sweet and powerful to drown my worries for the next few hours. Looking at the selection made me wrinkle my nose. These boys rarely drank anything except straight whiskey and thick, dark beers. Not exactly my style. The clubhouse hadn't been restocked in some time, which told me just how obsessed Daddy and his guys had really been about going after the Chinese. I passed on alcohol and chose a tall glass of water instead. It wouldn't make me feel better, but at least it would keep me healthy. Ellie Joe, a voice said behind me. Package. I turned around to see the prospect, Carbon, holding out a small cardboard box. I took it, Feeling the confusion twist my face, holding the lightweight box, I gave it a little shake. Who's it from? I asked, turning it over. There wasn't any return address. Carbon had gone behind the bar to dig around, coming up with a grin when he found half a bottle of Jack. Huh? Oh, don't have a fucking clue. Found it stuffed outside in the club's big locked box for deliveries this morning. Nobody gets in there without a key except the mailman, so it's got to be somebody who knows you. Hmm. I reached over to the bar counter, where I'd seen a pair of scissors, and began slicing off the tape. A strange odor hit me in the face as soon as I pulled back the flaps. The top was stuffed with a scrappy piece of paper smeared with red ink. It took me a minute to realize what I was seeing. Jesus Christ! Before Carbon could even stop sucking on his whiskey, I realized it wasn't red ink. 
blood formed blocky, messy letters meant for Blackjack and for me. Go fuck yourselves. No time to talk. One cut at a time makes a dead man. Z. I never should have let my hand wander into the box, searching underneath the paper. When I found what was making that stink I'd smelled before, the whole world started spinning. My fingers gripped something cold, soft, and pliant. Fingers slipped through mine, stiff as plastic. I pulled it up and screamed, all I could do before I slid off the bar stool and hit the floor. Babe, fuck baby, wake up. Asphalt kneeled on the floor, shaking me. I opened my eyes and saw half the club standing around me, a mixture of bewilderment and rage on their faces. They're killing him, I screamed, jerking up into my man's strong grip. That was his... his... Quiet. Don't fucking think about it. We are taking care of it. No more packages are getting to you without going through me first, woman. That's a goddamned promise. It was Daddy's fucking hand, Asphalt. I can't just forget. No, babe, you can't. He pulled me in tighter, hiding my face in my chest, running his strong fingers through my hair. But I'm gonna make you try. And you can be damned sure all those motherfuckers will pay for what they've done. Shit's downright fucked, the big one named Roman thundered above us. Nobody starts carving up a grizzly's present sends us the pieces. I sobbed all over again, smashing my face into Asphalt's chest. I still couldn't believe what I'd pulled out of the mystery package, what I'd held, feeling it ooze dead blood onto my wrist. I shouldn't have approached them. Blackjack walked up and laid a cool hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry about this, girl. I thought we could lure them into a meeting, a ruse for peace, then hit them the same way we've dealt with our enemies before. Asphalt looked at his leader, fury shining in his green eyes. It would have happened anyway. Everything she's told me says these fucking jackals are sadistic as the day is long. We gotta change tactics. They know what we did to the cartel several months back, and they're doing the same fucking thing to us. I staggered up with Asphalt helping me. Line stood in front of me, fists flexed at his sides, his face turning red around the eye patch. I'm so fucking sorry, Ellie Joe. He grabbed me, pulled me away from Asphalt, and squeezed. I just want him home safe, Uncle Line. You have to help. Already on it? My adopted uncle gave me one more reassuring squeeze before he released me, looking at the Redding men. We've got to hit them hard as soon as we can. We wait another day, another week. There won't be nothing left of my prez and her father. What's the intel say? The boys started talking about war among themselves. I faded out, too numb to comprehend what they were saying. Blackjack nodded at Asphalt, and my husband led me away, back toward the room that was starting to feel like a cell. Halfway there, I slapped his chest and backed myself against the wall. No, I need to get some fresh air. For a second, I worried he'd try to drag me back into the room. Instead, a thin smile curled his lips, and he took my hand. I know just the place. We headed for his bike and left the clubhouse. The wind helped dry the tears sliding down my cheeks. Locking my hands tight around my protector's waist warmed the glacier building inside me. I barely paid attention to where we were going. Didn't look around until I heard him kill the engine. Of course, I should have recognized it sooner. He'd brought us to the same park where we'd clashed our first night here, when he'd dragged me down in the dirt, kissed me in the rain, and lured me into bed. Let's go for a walk, Elbel. He helped me off my bike, and we headed down the trail, both of us turning briefly to the spot where we'd first wrestled with our love and hate on the ground. Look, I know you hate him, I said. You think he's a demon who put me at risk. You probably want to strangle him for bringing me to the Chinese and almost getting me killed. I understand that. I just know it wasn't supposed to go down that way, though. Daddy got a little reckless, 
Then he should be bawled out for that, or whatever you guys do when somebody goes against orders in your club. Asphalt's face showed nothing while I made my plea. I looked at him, moistening my lips, praying he'd truly listen to what came next. He doesn't deserve to die like this. You have to help him. Help me, Asphalt. If he's going to be butchered like an animal by those fucking monsters, it'll kill me. My voice cracked. I stopped in mid-step next to a tall tree with him. For a long time, he didn't say anything, just held my little hands in his, running his free hand up and down my cheek, wiping away every tear. God damn it, I love you, I sputtered, and I'm sorry, too. I'm sorry I didn't listen sooner. I could have talked him out of this, maybe. I could have— Babe, don't. You couldn't have done shit. I opened my eyes, blinking back fresh tears. He pulled me into his embrace and just held me against the breeze, protecting me from every kind of cold I'd been hit with lately. Here, I was really, truly safe, shielded from everyone who'd ever try to hurt me. Every tinder of pain and terror ignited by this world and the wolves who were constantly circling each other for dominance. The MC had caused a lot of pain and terror, no doubt about it. But it could also be a fortress when it needed to be, a place for men and the women they claimed to find what they needed to survive. Right now, I had everything I truly needed in my arms— I told you before, and for some fucked up reason you keep doubting it. I'm gonna bring your old man back here alive. Then I'm gonna bust his fucking jaw myself for his mistakes. The Chinese won't get another piece of him. I swallowed the bitter lump in my throat, remembering how cold, disgusting, and alien his dismembered hand had seemed in mine. How can you make that promise? He might already be dead, Austin. He's not, Ellie. I've known fucks like the Black Dragons before. It's not all business to them. They're bastards, like big cats. They like to torture their prey nice and slow before making the kill. And they'll probably try to do it when somebody's watching. Asphalt looked at me, his green eyes going dark as the Pacific tide. Your old man's alive, and he's in hell. My face cracked again, but not before he reached up, cupped my chin, and pulled my face close until we were just inches apart. We'll bring him home. One week. I'll ride everybody in this fucking club till they do it, or fuck, I'll take off and deal with them myself. This is the last day you're ever gonna cry, Ellie Joe, and I'm the man who's gonna make you stop. How could I argue with that confidence? I couldn't. Not when he jerked me close to his chest, tipped my face, and kissed me so hard, I thought I'd faint all over again. The boys were away all evening after we got back. I heard rumblings from the big meeting room next door and the occasional shout, Black Jack slamming something hard against the table, calling men to order. Finally, the door popped open and hit the wall, and men came filing out into the bar, rumbling among themselves. Asphalt opened my door, came in, and sank down into the worn love seat next to me. Well, I said, trying not to let too much hope creep into my voice. I shouldn't be talking club biz with you, babe, but I'm going to make a single exception to say this. He paused and looked at me with a stare so intense it turned my blood cold. We're sure the dragons are holed up in an old plant just outside Portland. Intel says your old man's alive just like we thought, though I'm not sure being handcuffed to a fucking radiator with one hand can be called living. I didn't care. Hearing confirmation that Daddy's heart was still beating was enough for me. I jumped up, threw my arms around him, and kissed the stubble on his cheek. Only problem with kissing this man? I always wanted another taste. No matter how dark or strained or dire things might get— he drew me like fire. Familiar needles stabbed at my nerves. I ran my fingers down his back, remembering how amazing it felt to have his naked skin on mine the night before. Not so fast, he said, pushing me away with a dark look on his face. What? What's wrong? 
busting in and decapitating the motherfuckers isn't as simple as it sounds. The Portland boys tell us this place they've got is built like a brick shit house. Clubs got their lawyers doing their damnedest to deflect the shit from the feds after that warehouse went up like a small fucking nuke. Thank fuck everything around it was abandoned, or we'd really be up shit creek. We can't have another firefight go down like that. Our network with dirty cops in Portland doesn't run as deep, and we'll all end up behind bars if the Chinese trap this place like they did the last one, start blowing shit up when we tango. I racked my brain. I wasn't even close to cut out for advising on strategy, but there had to be something they could do, some way to take down the bastards torturing my father without drawing too much attention. Does anybody in your Portland crew know Chinese? I smiled as he looked at me like I'd lost my mind, already knowing the answer. Thought so. Daddy was going to use me to make sure no tricks were going down when they talked among themselves, back when I thought they had a deal on paper. Maybe there's still some way I can help, figure out what they're really planning. Ellie, no. Fuck no. Asphalt grabbed me by the shoulders and gave me a hard shake. You're not getting within a hundred fucking miles of that city. Or between our guns. Besides, even if I lost my mind and let you show up there with us, they'd know something was up, bringing you back. I'm not gonna do it. That idea's completely fucked. But... No. We don't need to figure out what the assholes are saying to each other anyway. We just need to kill them dead without making too much racket. Honestly, it wasn't like I had a master plan for dealing with the dragons. But I wanted to help, damn it. I wanted him to listen, give me a chance. Help me help them save Daddy. We need to get ready to leave. I've said all I'm going to say about this shit, and we'll part ways at this clubhouse tomorrow. Assuming the Prez finalizes a viable plan for cleaning up this damned mess. Leave? Where are we going? You deserve better than this shitty cot for a good night's rest. I booked a place in town for us tonight. Let's roll. The motel wasn't super fancy, but my aching shoulders didn't care. The bed was a huge improvement over the beat-up cot we'd spent several nights on. And even that felt like heaven, after the two unforgettable nights I'd had nightmares in the dark, rusty storage unit. We grabbed burgers and headed to our room without saying much. I wasn't going to keep fighting him on my offer for assistance. Not today, anyway. The tension rolling off him was so thick I could feel it curdling the air. Asphalt's entire godlike body rippled in a constant state of tension, just how men always felt when they were about to go off to war. Neither of us knew when the trumpet would sound and he'd have to go ride off to Portland, or God only knew where. As much as I wanted Daddy home and the dragons buried so all of this could end, I feared for him. He had to feel it in my touch. I caressed him a little more gently and hugged him tighter than before, throwing my arms around his strong neck and pulling him to my lips. We'd be fucking soon, both of our bodies begging for it, as we twisted playfully in bed, the TV chattering away on low volume behind us. Deep down, I prayed it wouldn't be the last time, but if it was, then I had to make this the best night he'd ever have in his life. Fuck, babe, you've got a kiss men will kill for, he growled, pulling his lips away from mine after he'd already heated my mouth to about a thousand degrees. Yeah, how many men, I teased, running my fingers down the middle of his chest, trying not to bite my lip while my touch reminded me how hard, how strong, how ferocious he really was. Don't bullshit me, he snarled folding his arms around my waist and flipping me over, until I lay underneath him, my legs spread wide. You already know I'm the only one who'll ever own this pussy. You're wearing my brand, Ellie Joe, and I'm going to live to see lightning inked all over you. Mmm, I said, running my ankles up over his thick calves. Guess that means you'll have to come home to me safe after all this is over. I will fucking die for you, baby girl. 
His green eyes and the thunder in his voice turned deadly serious, making my breath catch in my throat. But not this time. I'm not leaving this earth till I've fucked you a thousand times and watched you get fat from all the kids I'm putting in you. I'm not fucking leaving. Pig, you're really set on this baby thing, aren't you? Lacrasse promise made me laugh. I pushed at his chest, making sure to dig my fingernails in past his shirt, just deep enough for him to feel how bad I wanted it. Yeah, baby, I fucking am. I've already got your ring, your brand, your heart. I want the rest, Ellie Joe, and you'd better believe I'm aching every damned night to knock you the fuck up. If you hadn't already been so sloppy with that birth control shit, I'd have flushed your pills down the fucking toilet. I want it so bad. Okay, I officially had a madman on top of me. But instead of flipping out or cowering in horror, my pussy melted in my jeans. His insanity turned me on like nothing else. The same raw, masculine possession that made me his before I'd accepted it, when I was just a naive little girl. You're talking crazy, baby, I whispered softly, running one hand across his cheek. Daddy's going to need my help when you bring him home. I need to find a good job. He sent me to college for a reason, and I'm not exactly a stay-at-home kind of gal. You know that. Babe, you know I do, and I don't give a single fuck, he growled, silencing me with his tongue in my mouth before I could say anything back. You're giving me a kid, and it's gonna happen soon. I'll take care of the rest. The club will help your old man, once we see how fucked up he is, and I'll make sure you get a good job. I smiled, shaking my head, already knowing what he was about to suggest. You already learned that Mandarin shit. The club's gaining more international business all the time. No reason you can't learn Russian or German or Japanese, too. Shit. You can learn whatever the fuck they speak in the North Pole for all I care. Just as long as you're happy. Laughing, I punched him playfully. Asphalt smiled and wrestled me harder into the covers. He'd given me too much to think about today, especially when the danger wasn't close to over. But the nightmare from this morning already seemed like ancient history. I swore this man's sex appeal and the good heart he had underneath the roaring bear tattoo did something to bend time, rolled it back, or maybe he just made me forget. And his body was the best amnesia a girl could ever have. His hands pulled at my clothes. He had them off in no time, and then he kicked off his own, exposing each layer of his perfection a little at a time. Asphalt's big chest rose and fell when he was naked, his excitement building. I pulled him into me with another kiss, feeling his cock rubbing against me. So fucking tight, he grunted, pushing into my wet pussy. He stretched me, filled me, and held his cock deep. I gasped, electrified with pleasure. My legs locked around his. The hunger was too great tonight. This wasn't a time to take it slow and explore. I needed to be fucked. Hard. I arched my body, pushing my lips eagerly against his. He growled into my mouth and began moving his hips, fucking his way into me, making my whole pussy ripple with his power. My clip burned. Each thrust came harder, and I wanted even more. I needed him to fling me around the bed tonight, take me, own me the way he'd promised. It had to be hard, rough, and merciless, so I'd have something to hold on to, something I'd never forget. Bad things had already happened. In this life, the worst was always around the corner. If it came, I didn't want regrets. I had to get fucked so hard I'd remember this night forever, remember the raw love and energy in every bed-slapping thrust. I took him eagerly, moaning when he sucked my bottom lip into his mouth, digging his teeth in. Asphalt thrust harder, holding his pubic bone against me, grinding his dick inside me like a bull in rut. There, there, I whimpered, breaking the latest kiss. Harder. Our eyes were electrified. I saw unbridled lust in his jade, 
and they reflected the same lightning in my own soft blue eyes, suddenly alive with the need to fuck like mad for just one night. Fuck, baby girl. Sometimes you make me want to do nasty, terrible shit. He slowed for a second, twisting my blonde locks around his fingers. So do it, I said, throwing my hips into his. Do them all. I wasn't sure what kind of challenge I'd just given him, but he accepted. Next thing I knew, he pulled out and flipped me over, slamming me down on the bed with one hand in the small of my back. You'll hurt for me a little first, he growled, rubbing his stubble against my ear. Then you'll feel so damned good. You'll never know how you lived without being fucked with no limits, Ellie Joe. That was the only warning I got before he shut up and brought his open palm down on my ass. I jerked with surprise, feeling the hot red needles shooting through my buttocks. I'd left myself wide open. His cock pushed against my pussy, sinking into me from behind, picking up where he'd left off. You fuck me with everything you've got, little girl, or I'll hit you harder. Show me you fucking love me, babe. Show me you can become a total goddamned slut when you're not teasing me with those soft kisses and the fire on your lips. Yes, sir. I threw my hips back into his so hard the bed began to shake. I fucked him for all I was worth, feeling him slap my ass again whenever I slowed down. Desperate to meet his frenzied thrusts. It didn't take long. The molten fire building up inside me broke through my nerves, the sharp, delicious agony he'd left on my ass cheeks blending like never before. I'd never thought I was into this kind of stuff. Tonight I stood corrected, and I think I became the biggest pain slut who'd ever lived. Being spanked by the wild animal fucking me from behind sent me into a universe of blinding pleasure I'd never imagined. When I came, my pussy tightened so hard on him, he had to use all his strength to keep going through it, fucking me into an orgasmic frenzy, robbing all of my senses except one. My mouth opened in a perfect circle, and I tried to scream, but nothing would come out. My lungs burned to keep oxygen flowing into my convulsing muscles, and I twitched hard on his cock, flopping like mad, especially when he growled. Asphalt pinned me down so I couldn't move, leaving me a prisoner to his thrusts. I couldn't tell where the first blinding release stopped and the next began. I couldn't talk, couldn't breathe, couldn't even scream, as he owned me in the deepest sense. He played me like his personal instrument, pulled every one of my strings tight, until they snapped off and the relentless fist tangled in my hair the savage thrusts, fucking me into carnal seas that tried to drown me. Can't breathe, can't breathe, and I fucking love it. Pleasure overwhelmed me. I thought the storm was breaking when I felt his fingers on my ass again, spreading me open, just above his pistoning cock. Two stiff fingers sank into my virgin hole. He held them there, stroking me, while his cock slammed deep in my wet pussy. I came again, panting bloody murder, somewhere between a scream and a moan. His name was the only thing on my speechless lips. I mouthed it like a mantra as both my holes tightened on him, and he erupted deep against my womb with a vicious roar. God fucking damn it! The pleasure ripped through us. So hot, so intense, so wild— I swore we'd fused into one shaking, grunting being for the next few breathless minutes. Austin, my love, asphalt my life, the one, the only, the love I'd always have written in blood, sweat, and tears. When it was finally over, I felt his hot seed trickling down my leg, just as he drew his cock out of me. Jesus, Austin, I said, focusing all my energy so I could roll into his waiting arms. What the hell was that? Who knew sex could be so... so... Explosive. Yeah, babe, it's a fucking grenade when you're with me. You think you've got it all figured out. 
that you know everything I can do, but you haven't seen shit. Grinning, he rested his forehead on mine, calming my lips with his before he spoke again. You don't have a fucking clue how I'm going to make your body shake in all the years to come. Can't wait to show you, Ellie Joe. Cannot fucking stand it. The boys were heading down to Portland soon. I overheard the whispers at the bar, sensing the tension coursing through the clubhouse like a dying autumn wind. The Reading men who'd taken old ladies made their calls. I heard brass, rabid Roman in their private moments, telling their women they were going to come home safe. The last rites an outlaw has before he puts his life on the line. My heart strings strummed each time and every night Asphalt kept me at the hotel, holding me tight against his chest when we weren't fucking hot and hard. You're staying under lock and key, babe, he told me. We'll keep a couple prospects playing rear guard to make sure you're safe while we make our big run. Don't fuck with them. They're trying to do their job. I tried to keep what he said in mind. I'd grown up with Daddy's prospects and brothers hanging around constantly, so having my own little security detail wasn't anything new. Too bad familiarity breeds complacency. The men were locked away all day in their meeting room, probably drawing up their final plans before they hit the Chinese hard. I had to get away from it, go somewhere to clear my head. Carbon drove me out to the park, where Asphalt and I formed our special connection. I was looking forward to a nice, long walk— trying not to fume that they'd completely ignored my offer to help them translate. Okay, so maybe there wasn't a place for my services, and putting me back in the danger zone was too much. But I could have went with them, damn it, could have followed them down to Portland for moral support or more, if they needed to know what the Chinese were really saying when they spoke man to man. Carbon wisely kept his distance. I walked the long trail up through the hills, looking back over my shoulder. Fresh smoke curled from the prospect's mouth into the cool Pacific air. I couldn't tell if the look of boredom on his face trumped the disappointment that he was being left behind to look after me while the others rode away to war. Dark thoughts crept up on me for the past twenty-four hours, until I couldn't hold them in any more. Losing Daddy and Asphalt both was a real possibility, and it gripped my heart like a boa constrictor, threatening to squeeze the life out of me one anxious second at a time. No, I couldn't think like that. I had to stay strong for both the men in my life. They deserved better than defeatism, and so did I. The sun picked a perfect time to break through the dull gray sky. For just a second, I stood underneath the lone beam— warming myself. Tried to absorb some sign from the universe that everything was going to be all right. If nothing else, it gave me the strength to get moving again. I told myself I'd hit the books later, maybe figure out what other languages I could learn from the club as a backup plan. Yes, I was actually considering Asphalt's crazy career offer. I rounded my way off the trail and looked for Carbon. Where the hell was he? He wasn't by the tree anymore. I shrugged, thinking he'd gone off to the public bathrooms or something. Maybe he'd snuck inside the small service building for a nip of something from a canteen. All these biker boys had to fall back on when they got bored and couldn't get into any new mischief. I headed for the building. Pushing open the men's room door, I poked my head in, taking a quick, cautious look inside before I called his name. Of course it had to be one of those old bathrooms that curved around a tiled bend, the kind that didn't let you see anything without walking straight inside. Somebody's footsteps scraped the floor, and a man cleared his throat. Carbon? I yelled softly, staying just behind the corner. Is that you? I'm ready to get out of here whenever you're— The man burst out from around the corner and tackled me to the ground. Before I could even scream— I hit my head on the concrete floor so hard my ears rang. He dragged me by the legs, and in the blinding pain, I couldn't even think to fight him. My legs wouldn't kick. My hands wouldn't claw at the ground. He swung me around the corner, kneed me in the spine, and began tying my hands behind my back. 
I caught a flash of several other devilish-looking bastards in neat black work shoes, their cruel faces smiling. Each one wore the same small golden dragon head on their lapels. I managed to scream for a solid second before the Chinese mobster clapped his hand across my mouth. Cold, deadly steel pushed against the length of my back, making me shudder. Scream again and we'll cut you open like your friend. He turned my head harshly, pointing it toward the dirty stall with its door swung half open. Oh, God! I recognized Carbon's thick riding boots unnaturally touching the ground. Blood pooled out beneath his body where they'd laid it on the toilet. A thick red stream that could only be coming from his stomach. He wasn't moving. He had to be. Shit! I sobbed against the asshole's hand, and the blade of the knife dug deeper into my back, one more ounce of pressure away from doing everything he promised. Just try my patience again, bitch. You got my brother killed. You're coming with us to talk to Z, and you'll tell us everything you know before we rip your whore throat out. Behind him, the other two laughed. They whispered several words in thick, angry Chinese, the last thing I heard before the pounding in my head caused me to black out. Save your energy, Brother Xiao. She'll have a heart attack when she sees what we've done to her idiot father. 10. Crusade. Asphalt. Gone? What the fuck you talking about? I sat up in my chair, looking across the desk at Blackjack. Roman's hands instantly fell on my shoulders, trying to keep me from getting out of line. I shot him a nasty look. Fuck him and fuck anyone who got in my way. If somebody had really taken Ellie Jo, like the Prez just told me, then I'd punch a hole through the entire fucking earth to get her back. A small strike team, no doubt, probably sent up here just for her. The Prez folded his hands neatly and looked at me, his dark eyes shining. You deserve to know, since she's your old lady, son, and we're going to bring her back. That's why I brought you here. You damned right we will, I growled, shrugging off Roman before he could get a death grip on me. We ought to be loading up and hitting the road to Portland right now, for fuck's sake. No delay. What difference is a few hours early going to make? Not so simple, Blackjack snapped. There's heavy storms rolling through just south of us now. The Tacoma men need time to mourn their prospect, at least a few hours to shake off the shock. They'd found Carbon completely gutted at the same park where I'd truly owned my girl for the first time. He seemed like a good man, but I couldn't care about that shit right now. I couldn't be fucked to think about anything except where my woman was and what the bastards who had her were doing. That fucking animal I'd beaten to a bloody pulp in the storage container had been about to force himself on her, tarnish what was mine, and only mine. My blood seethed like a volcano. I was about half a second from going thermonuclear, blowing the fuck up, and coating the prez and the enforcer with my own bloody gore. Let me do whatever it'll take to get us there faster, I said, feeling like a hero for offering them a diplomatic way out. Just let me get my girl, assholes, I thought. Then we'll all walk away satisfied. Can't let you do that, son, Blackjack shifted in his seat, slicking back his long gray hair while he tugged out a smoke from his pocket. He offered me one, and I shook my head. The man didn't speak till he took his first long pull and blew it high into the air. Roman! When I saw the giant walk to the door, cover it with his body, and stand there with his arms folded like the Berlin fucking wall, I knew the next shit rolling out of the prez's mouth was bound to be bad. This club's at war, about to go off to fight the most serious battle it's faced since the Mexicans. If we play our cards right, it'll be the last fight we face for a good long while. We'll bring Ellie Joe home safe and whatever's left of Gil. We'll murder every single black dragon in our sights. My fist hit his scratched-up desk. Yeah? Where's the fucking punchline? We can't do any of that if we've got a loose cannon in our ranks. Son, for the good of this club, this mission, and your woman, I'm asking you to stay behind and help the prospects hold down SeaTac. We need someone here to protect our assets and make sure the Chinese don't hit us behind the lines while we go for the throat. No way. No cuck-sucking motherfucking way. By some miracle, I just sat there, like a stone, holding in the rocket fuel billowing up inside me, making me feel like I was about to shoot through the goddamned roof. Blackjack's words washed over me. 
I saw Roman out of the corner of my eye, studying me, ready to knock me flat if my anger caused me to do something really stupid. They had to keep order. So did I. You understand, don't you, Asphalt? This move's the last one I want to make when I know how hungry you are to tear a piece out of those sons of bitches, but my first priority is keeping anyone from getting killed. Your odds are a lot higher than the rest of us when you're so pissed off. You're reckless. The dragons won't claim one more brother or any of the women who are family in this club. Do your duty here and we'll bring her home. Got it? Blackjack looked me dead in the eye and extended his hand. I took it without hesitation and gave him a shake, resisting the urge to tear his damned arm off. When I pulled my hand away, the Prez and Roman shared a bewildered look for just a split second. Too easy. What the fuck just happened? If I made them believe it, all the better. I'm going to get the hell out of here and work on the bikes. Need them tuned up in case we've got any surprises to deal with in our territory here. I stood, slowly shaking my head. Can't wait for this shit to be over, Prez, so we can go home to Reading without these fucking worries. You and all the brothers, son. You've got my thanks for understanding. I held my rage as Roman stepped aside and cleared the door for me. Didn't show any emotion till I was out, and then I headed for the garage, just like I said. I watched my brothers come out with guns, ammo, and a few first aid kits for their saddlebags a couple minutes later. Blackjack and Brass rode out ahead of everybody, leading the big war party out through the gates when everything was ready. Rabbit looked at me and gave me a stern nod on his way out. The respect in his eyes almost made me feel bad about the game I was playing. Almost. No, fuck that. With Ellie on the line, nothing, and I mean nothing, meant more than keeping her safe. The boys would ride slow, probably take the long route through to avoid the lingering storms rolling through the Pacific Northwest. I could cut around them, beat them to Portland, and kill half the fuckstains who had my girl before they even rolled into town. I waited till it was just me and a couple prospects who'd come up from Reading. Fished out every fucking drink I could find at the bar to keep them distracted and seal their yaps. A quick call had the hottest pussy in town on the way to the clubhouse, three escorts with virgin looks and fake tits that would keep those fucks hammered all night. Then— when they were laughing like drunken fools with their dicks straining in their pants, waiting for the girls to show up, I stepped out into the garage one more time. The whores grinned at me when they pulled up and made their way in. I waved them through without a second look, not even bothering to glance at their asses bobbing in those heels. I had better waiting for me when I got my girl home. Nobody saw the shit I took out of the vault. The only new toy the crew left behind because nobody knew how to work it. The Devils dropped it off in trade last week coming from Montana, a peace offering from Blaze to Blackjack since he'd managed to calm shit down with the rogues in Tacoma. They said they'd send instructions later about how to use the high-powered sniper rifle. I turned it over in my hands, marveling how it was just like the one I'd used at the range last month. It was supposed to be Roman's job to figure this shit out and keep it for dirty jobs in the club's arsenal. She was supposed to be in that vault, sleeping like an angel of death, ready whenever we called her to service. Too fucking bad I had to interrupt her sleep early. I packed her carefully on my bike in the long case, covering it with an extra tarp in case I passed any nosy cops on the road. I'd put that big killer bitch to work for me at dawn tomorrow, and she'd help me get my baby girl home alive. I rode without stopping for anything but gas on my way down. Took more than four long hours after leaving at midnight, and I approached the Portland outskirts in the same slow, brutal rain that slowed time itself to a trickle. Stopping at the last Phillips station before all hell broke loose, I did a quick call to Blackjack. The boys were at least a solid hour behind. Told him everything was fine back in Tacoma and asked for an update. They'd gotten slowed down by the storms more than me, despite leaving sooner, and one of the Tacoma guys had to stop for engine trouble on the way down. Fucking great. Great for me and the killer angel riding with me, the best chance Ellie Joe had at being saved before the dragons did worse. Blackjack was damned right about one thing. The hunger. I couldn't shake it, the firestorm raging through my system. My fingers burned every time I thought about squeezing the trigger with those motherfuckers in my sights. Blood for blood. Vengeance. Salvation. They had to die so we could live. The way of the universe. Kill or be killed, all I'd ever known. Except now I had something more important than that shit on the line. I had Ellie Joe, and I'd sworn an oath 